This is Keys to the Shop, live interviews from Coffee Fest New York City 2023, part two. Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Christy Furio. I'm your host for the show, and I am really excited for this second part of our live interview series from Coffee Fest New York City. Um, if you didn't listen to the first part, I would encourage you to do that. And you probably have listened to it if you are subscribed to Keys to the Shop. If you're not subscribed, I would really encourage you to just go over, take a couple of seconds and hit the subscribe button. You'll always be updated with new content as it comes out. We'd like to keep it fresh for you. For the past six years, over 700 episodes, fingers crossed, knock on wood, all that stuff, not been late with an episode once. Uh, and we haven't really missed one, I should say, <laughs> in that time. But there's a lot of content, and I love delivering this kind of value for you. So stay tuned by subscribing to the show. And also, do me a favor and uh, share these episodes on your social media. Just tag Keys to the Shop on Instagram, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, or whatever, and uh, let people know that this uh, resource is available to them. Now, uh, I want to mention, of course, Coffee Fest is the basis for this series. Uh, I go to coffee. I've been going to Coffee Fest actually for uh, it's almost 20 years now since 2004. Ever since I uh, won my first latte art competition back in 2004, I was asked back to teach latte art, and I have been a teacher, lecturer, trainer, and you know on and off judge. In these days, 100% full time head judge for latte art the entire uh, you know, majority of those 20 years. And so I'm very familiar with this trade show. And I can say with no uncertainty that this is an incredibly valuable experience for you and your team. Go to coffeefest.com and you'll see shows coming up in Louisville, Anaheim, California, and then in Orlando, Florida. And each one of those are going to deliver free or accessibly priced trainings, workshops, lectures, um, panel discussions, really resourcing and equipping you for success in retail coffee. Uh, there's also the latte art competition that I mentioned I was a head judge for. You also have the trade show floor, which features amazing vendors of great products that you can interact with one-on-one. -on -one. You know, this is a community event. So there's a great energy in the room. It's not just the coffee, it's the people. And uh, every time it's just a great experience. So go to coffeefest.com, use the code KEYS, K-E-Y-S, to get 50% off your registration when you do that. And I would love to see you at one of these shows coming up. I'll be at each one. So be sure to say hello. Register today over at coffeefest.com. All right, so we have the last three interviews of this live from Coffee Fest interview series uh, now on this part two. And in order of appearance, we're going to be talking with Jesse Harriet, longtime friend of mine, He's just a great guy, he runs the uh, company Copper Horse Coffee Roasters up in uh, upstate New York in Ithaca. And then there is a returning guest to the show, Jenna Gotthelf with Counterculture Coffee. And then finally, Anu Menon, who is the founder of Drift Away Coffee to end us the right way on the show today. So we're gonna start by talking with Jesse Harriet. And uh, Jesse, like I mentioned, is the founder of Copper Horse Coffee Roasters. I've known Jesse for a very long time, since 2006, 2007 or so. We've worked together and he's gone off to start his own company. And he presented at Coffee Fest on how to plan, prepare, and execute the right way to start up a cafe as a coffee roaster and wholesaler. Uh, this is something that he has done as a consultant for his clients, opening new coffee shops. He's done this for the better part of 18 years now. In this conversation with Jesse, we get to talk about what he talked about in his presentation on the main things that retailers and coffee businesses need to focus on to have foundations for success in their business. Now, I know it's a pretty broad topic and it's kind of purposefully broad, but um, Jesse does a great job breaking it down to a lot of different areas that if you did focus on them, they inform pretty much everything else that you do 
with your business. Now, you don't get to have as much experience as Jesse without having some real insight and wisdom. So I'm grateful for having the opportunity to sit down with him at the show to uh, tap into that wisdom. And so without anything else from me, let's get right to the conversation. Here now is my interview with the founder of Copper Horse Coffee Roasters, Jesse Harriet. So I'm here with Jesse Harriet, a really good friend of mine from back in the day who runs Copper Horse Coffee Roasters out in, it's not Ithaca, New York. It's, um, it's near Ithaca though. It's, what's the, the town? Brooktondale. Brooktondale. <laughs> See, I wasn't going to guess that. I, uh, I used to live around the area back in the day, but not anymore. But uh, I'm excited to talk to you. Um, you I know, am too. You've uh, been head down doing the work for five, six years now, right? Ooh, it's eight. Eight years. It's been that long? It's been eight years. Wow. I know. I don't think it has been either, but every year I have my anniversary and August <laughs> 10th, every year I go, oh wait, it's going to be nine years, August 10th this year. Oh, this that's year. right. Yeah. Now that I think about it, I, I, I should have known that. Yeah. No worries. So eight years of building a business from, you know, starting as just like getting your, your logo, getting your, your roast profiles dialed in and just getting your first wholesale clients as you do that you have to draw on a lot of past experiences to give you the confidence to make those moves as an entrepreneur so i'm kind of curious about how you've evolved your confidence as a a business owner and uh so so in a way that really benefits your your wholesale clients now because i know you do a lot of like uh, you help your clients with their their businesses you're not just a roaster i mean this has developed over the past eight years, but when you first started, how did you draw on that experience to really leverage it for their benefit? Well, I think first of all, confidence is and demonstrating enthusiasm for what you do is such a big part of what I share with people. That's huge. So exuding confidence is and demonstrating enthusiasm for what you do. Like for instance, Today, in both of the classes I worked with, um, we talked about your passion and exuding authentic confidence. Mm. So, and we also talked about your self talk in that, which the self talk is, and, and I think everybody at every level of specialty coffee deals with this. And I think this is one of the things I've learned a lot of this actually from my wife, but I've also learned through business that self talk in those things. For you, whether you're starting a coffee roastery, cafe, whatever, the self-talk you give yourself, for instance, let's say um, I'm just coming my first coffee fest this year. I'm going to feel like whatever I say to people is I might feel that imposter syndrome. Oh, yeah. Like that I am. I'm not really I don't really know as much as I should. But but sharing with people that everybody, including I, I say this in a, a, the most honest way possible to everybody, even myself, when I'm up there on stage, I talking to them, but I also have to deal with feeling like, well, I, I've been in this for almost two decades and I still feel like I don't know what I need to know. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So what I do with that with them is say, it's okay. Just recognize that in yourself. But if you love what you're doing, exude confidence in your mission because yeah. the values that got you to the vision to your mission is really authentic to who you are and maybe you don't know as much as somebody else that's been here for 18 years but what you do know is your community and those around you and what your vision is for your cafe so be confident in what you're doing like yes. and yeah. then we'll help you with the technical skills all that other stuff is not as far away as some people make it feel. Okay, that's a good word. I mean, because there is the technical ability you have to do the job that you closely relate to the gateway to confidence. And the way you're describing it makes it more like it is a choice you make and the faith you put in yourself and the why behind what you're doing that then is uh, matched with the development of skills that help sort of solidify the 
this this uh, confidence, right? So um, now yes, that's right. What you did a two hour uh, presentation workshop today on startups, and as a wholesale roaster, you get the opportunity to see people from all different stripes and backgrounds that just they want coffee, they want your coffee, right? And so you could easily just sell them the coffee and be like, "Good luck with my coffee." Right. <laughs> but yeah. You, you don't <laughs> want to do that. You, you, you want to be a student of the people who are using your coffee. And over the years, I'm sure you've kind of picked up on some because this is part of what you've presented, some keys to success from people who are starting their coffee shops. And I guess you don't have to not have a coffee shop right now if you're listening to to benefit from this. If you're an existing retailer, what what are the keys to success that you think are the most tangible and powerful over the course of time that you've you've been helping your wholesale clients i would say the the first two things are immerse yourself in education a sub part of that is to become like you said a student of everybody else oh okay become a student of everybody else. If you're worried about that confidence level, if you're worried about how are we going to be successful, then immerse yourself in learning about not only the industry, but other folks. So the second part of that um, really, in my opinion, is so you immerse yourself in education. And then the second part of that is building foundational infrastructure for what you're doing, because uh, and, and within that, I would say there's a couple of tips I give people. The why, what, and how to of the values, vision, mission, strategy, plan, action steps, and what you're going to do today. And with that, learning what's priority and non-priority, urgent and non-urgent. Okay. And basically yeah. streamlining your efficiency to say, within myself, I'm going to learn as much as I can. And then I'm going to be as efficient as I can, starting with the foundational parts of my business. So we we start with all of those startup costs we go to then um all of the basic things you need to do dba e federal ein business checking account all these things and then finding your local health department zoning building codes all those things but before you do any of those things you have to have these attitudes about education and these attitudes about how you're going to operate why it's very simple <laughs> because I've seen and been a part of things not going that way. And I've had the plans um, for how we're supposed to do timelines for different build outs. And the thing that gets uh, I, I'll get uh, basically what I said to folks today is that when it becomes really tough emotionally, OK, when it becomes really tough, when you hit a pitfall, like uh, a code enforcement officer that is giving you a hard time, yeah. Yeah. then all these things can, can basically block people from continuing to move forward. So the idea is you have these parts of it. Now I can go through all the different parts of starting up cafes and everything that we talked about. But the idea is when something's blocked and you have a different timeline for that item, then you keep moving everything else forward while still trying to work on that thing. But now if it's stuck in a certain spot, you don't want that to bring down and draw out all your emotional energy. I joke oh, with people yeah. that I'm part Sicilian and part of my Sicilian family said, we're emotional. We dwell, you know, <laughs> we, dwell. We, we, we ruminate, we, we ruminate, uh -huh. we obsess yeah, yeah. and people can get stuck in that. So the goal was giving them those other other strategies for like, OK, move over here and see what you can do today. And let's do that uh, because it's going to be there's going to be times within most people, three to six months time frame of starting a shop somewhere in there. Um, there's been longer time frames and shorter time frames, but overall to keep things moving forward. Um, so. Well, okay. Let me ask you something about this because one of the things that I find is that people will put 
a lot of energy into the initiation and the execution of the thing that brings something to fruition. So it, it brings it to, to pass. It, whether it's like, um, okay, we've got eight months before we need to start paying rent and we want to make sure the build out's happening and we're in budget and blah, blah, blah. So we're going to get to the point where we're, oh, we're open. We're, we got the soft open. We're, we got a grand opening. And now what? Now what? Now, is it a downer? Why is it a downer? What's, and we do the same thing with um, onboarding employees where it's like, one week of just like culture and passion for coffee and the industry and mm -hmm. the supply chain and all this other stuff. And then all of a sudden it's like, you don't see anybody who trained you ever again. You just kind of get abandoned. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it feels like sometimes maybe people do that with, with opening cafes too. Like they get all their, mo their best energy, the emotionality in those beginning stages to get the thing open, but there's nothing left over for actually running it once it is open. You know, so well, how do you how do you sustain yourself? Because you did this with your own business, and then you had like the real work to do uh, in the past eight years. That's that's the real stuff. But then there's that like really I, mean, I think overly romanticized part of like hustling to get it open and uh, the entrepreneurial journey. So in the real day to day, what sustains? consistent operational energy to to actually make the thing that you just created run for a while that's a great question so we talk uh, the other thing i focus on with people when we talk about this is what resources are at your disposal mm. so and one of those is uh emotional energy yeah. Another so like the resources would be say. Uh, I'll get this because when people talk about startups, they talk about having money and then worried about losing money once they're open. <laughs> so it's like, how are we going to get money? <laughs> and then once we have money, how are we going to not lose money? Right? Okay. So that's one resource. But then we talk about the resource of time, emotional energy. Okay. And then you have different financial resources. One of those is having a working space. Right. Uh -huh. And then the human resources of the employees you have, the talents you have around you, all those things. So I would say to maintain that energy once you get started, I will tell you, we we call it the cafe birthing process a lot. <laughs> OK, not yeah. that I know anything about that personally, but um, I've been next to people that do. And it is a lot of energy to to bring it to fruition. And your emotional energy is drained, usually by the first day you're open. Okay. And I'll tell you, when you talk about soft opening and grand opening, I have been doing this for a number of years now and I haven't seen anybody hit their initial target opening day. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I mean, it's, and it's nothing, nothing about anybody individually because it's this whole group of people. I've seen the same thing. So I try to tell people to prepare for the fact, let's get a first goal for this, but it might take longer, but also in the process one of the things I try to always tell people is because emotional energy is one of your resources and you deplete it, you have to find a way to fill up. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and that has to be taken care of. Um, and then everything about all of the other stressors and resources on the cafe, the money, the staffing, all these things, um, you know, basically are part of that whole process of, of balancing these resources. I tell people it's like a bar graph, like zero to 10, Get, do a self assessment on your time, do a self assessment on where your money's at, do a self assessment on where your emotional energy is at. I'm at a two out of 10 on emotional energy. I'm at a two out of 10 out of time. So I need to, how am I going to get those numbers up? Yeah. And you know, yourself that makes well sense. enough to know how that happens. I suppose like you can pay attention to like, it, it, maybe you need silence. Maybe you need solitude. Maybe you need people. Uh, it, it could be lots of different. So you're really talking about self-care in a way. Essentially. You, you're caring for the business and you feel like that's the most noble thing that you can do. But especially maybe in the, the opening stages, you're the asset. It's the business like everybody in their mom can open a coffee shop today. And not to sound like that's, you know, I don't, I don't want to, uh, you know, make anyone feel like, oh, you're just like crapping on, you know, it's, 
not as hard to open a coffee shop, especially today, as it used to be, I suppose. That's but correct. Yeah. Sustaining one, the difference we're talking about here is how you care for yourself and realizing that, I mean, it's it's about relationship. First, you with yourself, I guess, right? And then you with other people. So, I mean, that's the, the people aspect is really hard, too. So I, I imagine there's there's something else that we need to do to make sure that people that were managing the baristas and things like that, that can become the biggest stressor right there. Well, can I say too, I, I know some people are going to be like, yeah, Jesse, of course. But I will say that I tell people specifically when it comes to marketing and opening your cafe and cultivating a customer base before you even open is that business is personal. It is personal. Uh. It was part of my initial vision statement when I started. And I mean that as in, um, I don't know if you remember a number of years ago, but you're sitting with some people at a Seattle coffee fest talking about all of these cafes in Seattle and how what was everybody should be on par with quality and what was separating them apart at that point was the hospitality. Yes. So in other words, yeah. all these people that we thought were like, I thought because I was outside of this world, outside of Seattle, but like those cafes there were now focusing on hospitality. This is years ago, of course, but like they were focusing on hospitality because they already had, uh, everybody had really great quality. Yeah. And so I, I share with them that like, yes, business is personal. And yes, really, especially if you're starting your own shop, more so towns, um, specific parts of cities that you're part of a community of, like it is about you sharing yourself. That is the brand is you. And so if you don't take care of yourself in the process, I mean, I'll say there are plenty of times I didn't take care of myself well and I had to come back from it. And thankfully I had people around me that were like, dude, you are just, you're smoking yourself right now. And I'm like, yeah, I know, yeah, I know. Yeah. And then, um, you know, it's very tough of it. Roastery wise, you know, it's a cash forward business. So it's very, you know, it took, so it took a while, you know, but, um, but I will say with the, with the startups too, with the staffing, I mean, the thing I always talk about with them is that, um, you've got your, you know, when we talk about the why, what, how to stuff, yeah, yeah. the, the thing we talk about with staffing is very simple. It's hire people for the why, which we want them to be on board with what we care about. And so like high emotional intelligence, we've talked about this sort of thing before yeah. in various settings, high emotional intelligence, the what and how to of the skills of doing the job, we can teach them that Yes. and they can teach them that and that sort of thing. But the individuals like buying in and, and I said, one of the things I said today, which is pretty true as of late with talking with folks is a lot of the times doing like the standard that what used to be the application process for cafes is kind of the last resort for yeah. people to find people. Mm -hmm. A lot of people that are starting up cafes are finding people around them that they know that are like, as they're doing it, they join in with, they're like, I want in on this. Yes. Yes. And they might be doing, and it might just be a side gig for them to be a barista with their friend. But I'm finding all of these people are finding these people around them instead of an application process. And it's actually, I think it's very healthy for them and their communities to find people around them. Interesting. Um, that are like-minded individuals. Well, you have to have the confidence to put yourself out there to let people know you're doing something in order for that to happen. And a lot of people will operate in their basement until they put the shingle out that says we're open and be like, why is nobody here? Well, this, this is the practice we do today. I encourage anybody that's doing this to be able to try this. Is The first thing, when I had everybody introduce themselves in the class, mm -hmm. I said to them this, tell me your name and your town and pitch your cafe to me like you'd pitch it to your neighbor. Tell me about your cafe like you would tell me, tell your neighbor. Because you need to start practicing doing that right now. Yes, yes. Like every person you talk to, mm -hmm. you need to say, this is me I'm doing. And we had all this, all this, um, quite a, quite a lot, quite a diversity of different <laughs> yeah, places. You were me about that earlier. It's crazy. Yeah. So, um, but everybody was able to do that pretty well. And then I was like, just keep doing that. Keep practicing that. Keep telling people about it. And then you'll find people in your path that 
the the other the other resource that I do not ever want to underestimate, which has helped me so far, so many times, is I tell them a resource everybody forgets about is advocates. People people are selling our coffee to other people yeah. that have nothing to do with being employed with my business. And I cannot tell you how grateful I've been to them over the time. Customers that come to me and buy my coffee and then they start telling other people about it. Yeah. Same thing with people in your community. You know, when you start to do the thing where you're starting to sample what you have from your cafe and that sort of thing, other people will say, Hey, and it's the same thing with any other, um, referral, you know, street referral stuff, you know, like, I, we're here in New York City. Everybody's like, hey, you should go to this place. This is the this is the place. It's the same sort of thing, except I think everybody everybody doesn't realize the huge resource that has been for somebody like me. I mean, the re not realizing that resource is everything to do with really not having an imagination beyond what's in front of you. And not know, for instance, to go along with that, we don't know the opportunities we've squandered by, you know, how many off days have we had on the bar where we didn't give great service, but we could have, if we just did a little bit more, that one person would have become that advocate. Um, and so we just chalk it up to a bad day or, or whatever, but we don't realize, we don't know what we don't know. So if we're curious about it and, and then, then we can just say, I, I think that what's going to motivate, we're talking about energy. What's going to motivate me to continue on is the fact that I believe and the substance of this thing I don't see, which is the advocacy of other people because of how, because of what? Because of how I've treated them, I guess? I mean, like, what would you say to that? Like, if, he, if it's a matter of saying, okay, you sold your coffee to somebody and they like your coffee, th it could be over right there. But how do you go from being a customer to an advocate? When it comes to advocates, I have found there's there's one law that all of my staff knows in our roastery if somebody comes and visits us they get a free bag of coffee oh uh, yeah okay. okay okay and we start out that's how we started the relationship not from a buy from us we want to take from you but we want to give to you we want to share this to you and everybody in my, everybody in my my that's with works with me knows that's what we do okay and there have been more <laughs> advocates created from just that one thing yeah. I told I told people today um, uh, I, I listened to this podcast called how I built this with Guy Raz yes yes I hope that's okay I <laughs> just kidding, well, yeah, okay great podcast so uh, I just heard the Guia Key Yerba Mate podcast okay. and of course some people would consider the mate was trying to get you know they're trying to get people not to drink coffee anymore so it's kind of funny but I love learning from everybody um, and they said over 10 years, they gave out over 5 million samples of their mate. Wow. Okay. But look where they are now. Everybody knows where they are everywhere. So my, my point is, is that I have found after the fact that people I've given coffee to mm. have then told other people about it who told other people. And then all of a sudden we have started working with certain shops because of that one bag we gave yeah. away a year and a half ago generosity begets generosity boom that's it yeah, yeah. jesse uh always a wealth of knowledge and I, I i really appreciate you taking time here uh to talk where can people go to learn more about copper horse coffee dot com copper horse coffee dot com that's it there it is <laughs> yeah great awesome well thanks for your time man it's been great being here with you and being back it's been so long since i've been back in coffee fest so it's awesome to be back Okay, everyone. Well, I hope that you enjoyed that conversation. Um, Jesse, again, like I said, brings a lot of wisdom to this conversation. I, and the things that he has mentioned in our uh, talk, I think are applicable to any coffee bar, no matter if you're a brick and mortar, a coffee cart, a drive through whatever it is. Um, I'm really grateful for Jesse being so generous and sharing with us. If you want to stay in touch, you want to order coffee and learn more about Copper Horse Coffee Roasters, go to their website, copperhorsecoffee.com. Now, our next interview features a returning guest to the show, Jenna Gotthelf of Counterculture Coffee 
Jenna Gotthelf is an advocate for creating progressive and approachable learning opportunities for anyone who brews coffee. Jenna is based in New York City and is the wholesale education manager for Counterculture Coffee, where she oversees the barista training program carried out in the training centers across the country. Jenna is also a longtime U.S. Coffee Championships competitor and has placed everywhere from first to last and also somewhere in the middle for Brewers Cup and barista competitions. In a previous episode with Jenna, we talked about barista sustainability, uh, just the idea of creating sustainability for baristas in the coffee shop. So you'll see that uh, listed in the show notes if you want to go and listen to that episode. But on this conversation, we're going to be talking to Jenna about how to educate consumers. And that's really a loaded phrase like what does that look like in a a positive way ultimately is the goal of this conversation and uh the answer to that question is kind of it depends and you know how do we make decisions and what to embrace in terms of education based on where we are in our business and jenna breaks it down really well for us and how we can approach creating educational opportunities for our consumers that actually serve them well and uh, serve our business as well at the same time. So I'm really excited to present another uh, conversation, albeit a shorter one than the last time with Jenna. So here now, without anything else from me, is is my interview on the show floor of Coffee Fest New York City with Jenna Gotthelf of Counterculture Coffee. Okay, I am here with Jenna Gotthelf and uh, the second time on the show, right? Yeah. It's been four years? It has been. You want to hear something funny about the last time we had a keys to the shop conversation? 100% do, yes. Um, I was uh, in an apartment and there was a wasp that started that I noticed <laughs> about halfway through the interview <laughs> flying around and it was, uh, I'm not like a wasp, I, I don't dislike insects or bugs, but um, I'm not not afraid of them. So uh, that was real. Yeah. And there, so, there are no bugs here. So if we listen back to the episode, can we, can we find some some trembling and some some fight or flight in your in your words you think that's a good question <laughs> um well it's a great reason to listen to jenna's episode again though so that, that you have that you have a little link back there yeah um well i'm excited to talk to you in fact we're sitting next to the venue at the conversation corner here at coffee fest where you're going to be speaking on consumer and customer education and, and i'll be speaking just a, in, a, in a second here after this interview so i'm really excited to talk about education for customers because I think it can be a hot button topic where we want to give them all of our information in print, in words, and sometimes people just push back against that. There's a lot of dynamics and I'm, I'm just to start the conversation off, what is your philosophy that you would tell a, a client or somebody you're training about customer education that would give them a good starting point to start going down the right path great question so I, I think there is nothing quite like having coffee in a coffee shop um, having coffee in a coffee shop isn't just about drinking coffee it's the environment that you're in everything is curated based on what the goal of that shop is so I think being confident that teaching consumers uh, isn't going to compromise the essence of what a coffee shop brings to the table is a really important concept to have in your pocket when approaching consumer education. I don't think we have any information we should be hiding um, because when a person is making coffee at home, they're not making coffee in a coffee shop. So whatever, it, the, you know, the goal for consumer education is how can we uh, get this uh, human being who's coming into this space uh, to want to continue to buy coffee here from us, also from our peers around the coffee roasting producing world, but also like you know, what makes us stand out yeah. um, and like how, how can we help folks make that coffee taste really, really good? Um, it's not rocket science to make delicious coffee uh, at home. And I think that there are just a couple little nuggets uh, or more bigger nuggets to be shared yeah. um, if there is the space and opportunity for it during that customer uh, barista interaction. So space and opportunity is something that you mentioned as something we can recognize. If it's there, then you go ahead. So I think a lot of people might have trouble recognizing what those cues are. What are some of those things that we can pay attention to? Totally. Well, uh, it is extremely difficult to give brewing advice in the middle of a 
morning rush where everybody is like, <laughs> let me get that vanilla latte and that whatever coffee. I order all of the things that might uh, be in the queue. Um, so probably those are the most, most difficult times to uh, answer any coffee education forward questions from consumers. But I think that if, you know, especially if you're working uh, at a shop that's selling retail coffee, you know, the goal of selling retail coffee is to brew coffee at home. Um, so having a little something to, to share with consumers uh, can be very helpful. Now, do I think that it's necessary to like go into a full coffee lesson from behind the bar? Um, I don't because there are, you know, classes that people um, depend on for their livelihoods that, that where they teach full on down the rabbit hole things. So yeah, I think that yeah. as baristas, you know, we can give nuggets um, because that's all the, that there is really time for behind the counter. Those interactions are also short. You're not going to spend three hours with a consumer teaching them how to brew coffee behind the counter. That's right. Um, but like there are classes that consumers can invest in to do that. And there are also YouTube videos and Instagram snippets and whatever social media you can have in your little hand computers. Um, so there, there are, you know, there are rabbit holes. Um, and I think that as baristas, we have an opportunity to kind of like scratch the surface of the rabbit hole. Okay. So we're, we're kind of fitting customers with the right information. We're paying attention to opportunities to, to speak about it, but we're editing ourselves enough. You know, we're basing it in reality, like, like you said. The, the, it's only nuggets, but it's really it's the, a taste. It's a taste of something that we want them to pursue a little bit more so that we maybe we have an outlet for them. So if you are a coffee shop, right, maybe you have online videos or YouTube videos. And I mean, if you're going to engage in customer education, I guess you should have another level for people to engage, right? I mean, how do you go about maybe creating many levels of engagement, starting with the nuggets, right? We can talk a little bit about coffee, but is there, what are some options we have for the next stage, further down the rabbit hole. Totally. So um, I like to call these opera brunities. Um, <laughs> I love this. Uh, you know, uh, your last episode had that uh, barista sustainability. Now we're what is it? Barista sustainability. Oh no, the brew brew. Opera brunity. Opera brunity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Heck yeah. Um, so I think that um, if there is uh, time and space in the coffee shop that uh, one is working at mm -hmm. to facilitate classes. Yes. I think that is awesome. And that is something that can be another nugget, uh, another layer. I think that customers really do enjoy learning from the baristas who they get their coffee from every day and build uh, that that relationship with. Um, and uh, but, I, you know, also recognizing that like service is busy. Uh, too. So like being mindful of, you know, scheduling and when that happens and not just like the space that an event like that um, takes up in, a, in the physical space, but also like the labor that comes after it. Because if you're teaching a class, um, you're also cleaning up after the class. And so who's doing that? Is it the speaker? Is it the barista who's, you know, maybe still working? So I, so I think that it's there's a lot to take into consideration when also um, facilitating stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, the business is a multifaceted operation and um, it is also the case that people want to educate the customer with materials and bags and to just give as much information as possible. And earlier you said, I don't think we should be hiding any of the information from, from customers. And we're all about transparency is the, like the buzzword for, for everybody right now, right? Mm -hmm. But um, there's also... Yeah, you know, maybe if I can be a little antagonistic, there's like a lot of questions we're answering that people aren't asking that they don't want to be bothered with. So like, how how do we balance like giving people the right information in these these venues where they can latch hold of a uh, hold of it? Like maybe it's elevation, maybe it's tasting notes or or people's names that grew the coffee. But but what's the right kind of education in print form for people to engage in? Um, like physical materials yeah. to help. So I think that, you know, the starting point for brewing coffee is what are you doing? What are you brewing? Right. You have coffee, you have water, you have a brewing device. And the goal of using all these things is to get a cup of coffee. 
So there's a lot of information that goes into those those steps, um, but I think that you know knowing, uh, like having the coffee brewing be kind of like the the point where it's it's starting because that's also the goal. So like if the start and the end point are at the same point, then it's like a full circle. Okay. Yeah. It's yeah. a full circle. Okay. So that means if you're talking about educating somebody on the bag of coffee the ultimate goal of that bag of coffee is that they're going to drink it is what you, you know and so you you have to equip them with the ability to do something great with it is that what you're saying i do think that um having brewing instructions on on coffee bags is really helpful okay but also not always necessary some people suggest things like this yeah. is for espresso or this is for chemex or, or something like that I feel like there's you could get so deep with concepts like that, like this specific coffee is for this specific application, when you could really brew coffee just about any way. It's just a matter of your preferences and also your goals. And also like maybe like a more soluble coffee is going to be easier to brew as espresso, yeah. but that doesn't mean that you can't take that, that dense light roast and smash those beans up real fine and add hot pressurized water to them and something delicious will still happen. It's it's all just relative. Um, when we educate people, you use the word preference. We as the coffee experts, whatever, you know, quote unquote, will say on the bag, like I mentioned, here's what we think you should brew this as. And what I hear you saying and what I think I also think is that it might dissuade somebody from buying that coffee if I'm telling them that it should be a drip coffee and a Chemex and I could make it and love it as an espresso but we're saying well kind of saying we, we, we know more than you and in order to be successful you should probably listen to us yeah I think we all know different things and I think that um, you know I, we could always make suggestions uh, yeah. but ultimately we should I think that yucking yums is uh, <laughs> makes things really hard. And so I think that to create a more welcoming uh, industry and a more welcoming learning space, really keeping the, the, the open mind, open grind mentality um, to, to just kind of be like, okay, we're, we might all be starting from somewhere different, yeah. um, but, but let's, let's go and grow. Well, I might not want to yuck a yum, but I might want to avoid a yuck. And yes. this is why I tell you, don't brew this as an espresso. Right. It's terrible. So it, that's just like preemptively uh, yucking a yum, isn't it? <laughs> no, I mean, if you don't have, uh, it, it does take a skill set okay. to brew uh, certain kinds of coffee uh, well through different brewing methods. Uh, it is, and that doesn't mean that you can't learn to do it or brew it. That's why you would invest in education, right? Like if you get a really dense coffee from anywhere in the world, um, and you try to brew it on espresso, and the last espresso you dialed in was, you know, something that is more classically understood as an espresso profile, those mm -hmm. darker, you know, chocolate caramel nutty flavor profile. Um, you're gonna, it's gonna be hard, and you're gonna probably rip through that bag of coffee real fast, yeah. because there are differences that you can expect from a coffee like that. Uh, and so, uh, you know, just like anything proceed with caution a $23 bag of coffee that's expensive right um so like and that's a lot more affordable than a Lamborghini yeah and but um like a like a, a $23 bag of coffee and a brewing class um you know that's that one brewing class is gonna last a lot longer that Lamborghini will because yeah. that you could crash it like what do you you know you're and gonna, you, yeah, yeah. Uh, and you incentivize people it's not like uh, you're going to buy another Lamborghini necessarily. I mean, you can buy a lot of bags of coffee. So like you're saying, it's going to incentivize you to like, if I know I'm going to be successful, just like if I know I'm not going to get great service at a coffee shop, probably not going to go back. And I'm not going to buy your coffee, your, your coffee. If I just all of a sudden, you know, I'm just like, Man, I just don't, I can never brew this the way I like it. It's the, well, first of all, that I might think I don't like Guatemalan coffee. That's what I'm going to walk away from this with. Guatemalan coffee stinks. And um, I just avoid it because we weren't setting them up for success with educating them about maybe some good ways to brew generally. Um, so I guess that's a fine line to walk to say, don't don't create such a narrow path to, to, to education where they can only brew your coffee a very specific way 
but also don't neglect to give them some instructions to actually do it the right well not right way but a more successful success is more likely totally yeah interesting so now if we're going to take the first step and this is my last question to you is it, taking the first step to invest into these educational processes in our business um, let's say that we're a coffee shop who we, we have some of our own roasted coffee um, it sells okay we haven't really done much in customer education. I mean, it's all we can do to just educate our own baristas. What are some uh, ways that we can take some first steps into educating our customers to empower them? Um, I think like doing tastings is great. Uh, that can be a, a way to get people uh, excited. And also, um, you know, the, fo a, a nugget like uh, coffee is a fruit is a sentence that is shocking to a lot of people. Mm. And so I, I think that that there are so many opportunities to educate, it's just about doing it, you know? So it's like, if you want to do it, you can do it. It's really just a matter of like setting it up, doing the things, doing a little work before, promoting the thing, engaging your community. You have people coming into the coffee shop, yeah. every uh, hopefully, right, God willing. And, um, and, and so you have an yeah. audience. So like, don't be afraid to ask them if they'd be interested because what's, what's the worst that you're gonna have happen? They're gonna say, no, I'm busy or no, I'm not really interested. <laughs> okay, because like for every no, you're, you're, you might get a yes. Um, That's right, so. it's better than nothing. Yeah, exactly. I like to say you under extract 100% of the shots you never pull. <laughs> I love it. Uh, Jenna, always great to talk to you, um, and I, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us about this. Where can we learn more about, because I know you work for Counterculture I here do. in New York. I um, am. Where can we learn more about that and uh, maybe educate ourselves? Uh, so we do a free tasting every Friday morning uh, at 10 o'clock. Uh, this was a tradition that uh, was long standing at Counterculture. Uh, we stopped doing it when the pandemic started and uh, we brought the tradition back uh, this past January. Nice. Uh, so you can, um, well, find any of the counterculture uh, wholesale teams at training centers uh, across the country. Uh, we're, we're in a lot of t 11, 10. We're in a lot of spaces. <laughs> New York, I mean, we're Durham is our headquarters. Uh, we're in Asheville, North Carolina, Los Angeles, Seattle, Dallas, Miami. Boston, <laughs> Chicago. I'm nervous I'm going to forget when Charleston, uh, uh, D.C., Washington. Um, you are the ones. You know who you yeah. are. <laughs> yeah. So go do a tasting at 10 because uh, um, you will definitely. That's a great place to, to learn um, and answer. Get any questions answered and drink delicious coffee with uh, folks from anywhere they could possibly be from. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Thank you, Jenna. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, well, again, uh, great to have Jenna back on the show and breaking down how we should approach these educational opportunities with our customers, providing platforms for them to learn more about what we do, and ultimately doing it in a way to equip them to be successful with our coffee, to really appreciate uh, that product in a, in a way that's meaningful to them and have this be something kind of like hospitality you know we're doing this for our customers and not to them and uh, the things that jenna brought up in our conversation today i hope that you put into practice in your store so big thank you to jenna for joining us on the show and if you want to stay in touch with what's going on at counterculture like jenna mentioned you can try to go to one of the tastings at 10 at one of their training centers that they have located across the country. And uh, you can learn more about Counterculture Coffee uh, over at counterculturecoffee.com. And so now we are on to our last interview for our series on this episode, uh, part two for live interviews from the show floor of New York City's Coffee Fest. And uh, we're going to be ending by talking with Anu Menon, who is the founder of Drift Away Coffee, which is a sustainability-focused direct-to-consumer coffee roaster based in Brooklyn, New York. Anu uh, is an engineer-turned-marketing consultant, and she leads customer experience and sustainability at Drift Away and is passionate about building an approachable, equitable, and transparent coffee value chain that's what they're about at drift away coffee and we get to learn a little bit more about that in this interview and especially the idea of something that anu uh, presented on at coffee fest which is 
digital first customers and how to serve them. In other words, customers that, you know, they're going to interact with your brand online. And so this is the hospitality experience of the present moment that needs to be focused on. And how do you put out your brand and your products and give customers the opportunity to interact with the values of your company even through your products in a digital space. Anu shares some great insights as to how the typical coffee shop and coffee roaster can further embrace the digital world and the customers of your coffee shop and brand that exist in that space as the first point of contact for your company. So I was really excited to have this conversation and I'm excited to share it with you. So here now is my interview all about the digital first consumer with a new menon of Drift Away Coffee. Okay, I'm here at Coffee Fest with Anu Menon of Drift Away Coffee in Brooklyn. How are you? Good. Thank you for having me. You're this welcome. Is great. <laughs> you were uh, ha- had a, a discussion here at Coffee Fest about the digital first consumer and customer. Yes. Um, it, it, I am really fascinated by that. As we were just talking a little bit before we recorded about the um, how a lot of coffee farmers are on Instagram. They're yeah. they're this is how they get their information because they're a younger generation of professionals. Yeah. This is probably also true of most people these days that are getting into the business. So talk to me a little bit about your business and it did it evolve to be digital first or was it always digital first? It was actually always digital first. So my background and my partner's background, we're both engineers by studying and then we worked in a digital marketing firm. And then after like six, seven years of that, we wanted to do something different. We wanted to do something that we created of our own. Um, and because our background was always digital, we we always kind of knew we would do something digital. Like that's our comfort space. Okay. And so that felt, you're, you're like, eh, this is what we're familiar with. Yep. We're going to open our business. And it started out with roasting and just sourcing coffees. Like tell us a little bit about the scope of what Drift Away does. Um, yeah, so we roast coffees. We do coffees from all around the world. Our model is started out mostly subscription based. So the idea being that you get five different profiles in your first delivery and then you try all of them out. And so a profile could be like we have a fruity, which is a light roasted Eastern African, for instance, or like not necessarily East African, but light roasted, more fruity notes, a classic, which is what you traditionally think, like yeah. chocolate, nutty. And the model is that if you, you choose one, you choose which one you like, or you choose multiple, and then you get new coffees that belong to that same taste profile every month over month. Oh, wow. So okay. we rotate between like five coffees every month. Wow. Which is crazy. Okay, it keeps you busy. Yes, indeed it does. At least our roaster and green buyer is always busy. Okay, and how long has this been uh, going on? How, when, did you, when did you found this? Since 2014. 2014. So when we started, we started out of our apartment. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were roasting in a tiny little bee more, <laughs> if anyone. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. is how we started. And yeah, now we have a, a, fil- a facility in East Williamsburg in Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a big uh, Loring S35. Very cool. That we okay. Roast from. You were roasting on the bee more, and one day you'd be more. <laughs> uh, so now, let me ask you this. Yeah. You're digital first, meaning that you are primarily reaching out to people as a way, uh, like online to communicate something that they're going to experience in person. Yeah. And this is something that coffee shops add to their operations. Yeah. You started with it. What are the challenges of being digital only when you're communicating something as visceral and, and tactile as coffee? I think one thing we realized right in the beginning itself is that if you don't get to try it out, you need proof from other people that it's good. So it's not just our website or me telling, oh, this is great coffee. You yeah. need social proof. So like from the beginning, we our outreach strategy was trying to reach out to either influencers, online media, that sort of stuff, because people don't necessarily want to hear from you, but they want to know that you know, Wall Street Journal thinks you have really good coffee or oh, yeah. uh, Vogue thinks you have good coffee and so on. Because they don't trust you. Yeah. Because right? you're, why would they? Because you're the business owner. You're going to say all sorts of great things about your coffee. You should use me. So you need those, like you'll see even on our website, like pretty much up front, we'll put all those, what we call social proof and the reviews and all of that okay. online so that um, people know that you're good. Awesome. So let me ask you this. Now you're giving your talk about digital first. What kind of 
information do you think a crowd that here at Coffee Fest, like we're at uh, the Keys to the Shop booth here, we've got all sorts of people, different age ranges, backgrounds, cultures. They're probably small to medium sized coffee mm-hmm. businesses getting into coffee shops and roasting. How, how can they benefit from really grabbing a hold of digital uh, communications and representation of their brand uh, in, in your experience? Um, so I think it's good to start out with kind of breaking it down. So in terms of digital, when you think about the funnel, you think about, all right, there, the first stop, first part of it is awareness or reach. So how do people hear about you? Yeah. Second part is consideration and conversion. So like, what are the things that makes you consider the brand more? Is it their brand story? Is it like what they do, et cetera? What are these other things? And then lastly, they've become a customer. How do you get re- you know, repeat purchases? So I think for anyone who's thinking about digital, um, and we like, you know, we are independent, we are a small team, so we've always kind of have to figure out like, where do you put your energy? Because there's yeah. so much to do as an entrepreneur, as a business owner. So I think you look, think about in all these three things, what is, what's the thing that you know that your business needs the most at that particular time? Because we all need all of it, but what do you need the most of? So for instance, for us, um, it was awareness. People had never heard about our brand. Oh. So yeah. yeah, people were coming to the, I mean, there were people who once they got to the website, we saw them converting at a decent rate. And I mean, you can optimize all of it, but like what is that first thing you should focus more on and then you can move on to the other things. And so for us, it was for a long time brand awareness. And I think it still is to be honest, because we've optimized a lot of the other parts. So how do you, go out there and get people to hear of your name when you're a website. Okay, so and that's the challenge for a lot of people who open coffee shops is they think that if they open it, they will come. And and that's only if you have like heavy foot traffic and barely anybody does have heavy foot traffic. Even here in New York, you can't just rely on foot traffic. So what you're saying really resonates no matter who you are because when I started in coffee, back in like a long time ago, <laughs> there was a very few people that were in coffee. Hmm. Now, I mean, it is a hundred times, maybe more of what it used to be. So there's a lot of voices out there. Yeah. Yours needs to stand out. So when I hear you talking about figure out what you need the most, and it's a, you know maybe awareness, if it's something else, how do you figure out what you need the most? So, I mean, in our case, what we did is um, we looked at our website. We looked at how many visitors come into our website. We looked at how many orders we get out of it. So your conversion rate. Uh, We looked at online what the benchmark for conversion rates are. And ours seemed pretty good, decent. So we were like, okay, it can get better. But our real problem is we need more visitors. Yeah. And you know, you were saying like there's there's always a struggle, how do you get more people? Because there's so many coffee brands, like, so how do you really differentiate? So that's the other thing we really worked on, like um, communicating how we're different from other brands and constantly building on that. Mm-hmm. So you follow the pathway of saying, if we got this, it will translate to these results. These are the results that are important to us right now as a company. Yeah. So for instance, uh, you know, people who want to sell more whole bean coffee, in their coffee shop. They roast their own coffee, they put a lot of money into starting to roast their own. But people aren't buying the bags of coffee. Hmm. And they they think, well, you know, maybe there's something we can do in store, we're gonna put out like specials and things like that. What are they getting what are they getting wrong with some of the ways that they handle these these problems that they're they're not really addressing with digital solutions? Uh, I think it would be super interesting for like So I think there's a whole thing for coffee shops, like how do you convert those visitors to online? Um, And so collecting email addresses and giving an incentive for email addresses, because nobody wants to really give you the email address that easily, let's be honest. So like, do you do weekly giveaways? Do you do monthly giveaways and kind of collect email addresses? Um, Of course, use those email addresses respectfully. So, you know, don't sell them, um, send communication, not too much, not too little, like at the right frequency, set the right expectations. But you can set up, like I, I, don't, I don't know how many coffee shops, and you'll probably know this better, um, do 
sort of like a welcome campaign. So what we do, for instance, is if we get an email address, right at the point when we add it to our system, you get an email saying, welcome you know, to our newsletter, this is our email list, this is who we are, this is what we do, this is what we care about. But then it doesn't stop there. Then three, four days later, it automatically you get another email that may talk about our coffees. And then a few days later, it may talk about sustainability because we do a lot of things in that space, we're passionate about it, and we kind of want to tell that story. And a lot of it, it's about also, I think, the soft sell. So talk about the things that you care about. Oh, and right. um, because we've also noticed, and this is true for Instagram too, like every time we do direct marketing, like buy this, buy this coffee, you get less, I, it, I feel like we get less engagement, but instead, if you talk, tell people or try to educate on like how to brew coffee better, how to uh, make best, better coffee at home, yeah. what's a good espresso machine, they are engaging them and you're actually helping customers, yep. then the rest follows. It sounds so dangerous because we want, whatever we invest in, we want direct results. Yeah. We don't want to address it directly. But here's the thing, why would, this is a weird example, but if a watch company says, we want James Bond to wear our watch, in the next movie. James Bond's not going to be like, let me see what time it is, you know? <laughs> but but people are going to search, that was a cool watch in that one scene, that watch company, Omega Watches or whatever, is going to be like more orders because of that movie. So if people see, I, I hear what you're saying, like it's tangential. Yeah. Right? It's on the, it, it's like they want you and you are the coffee. They're going to buy your coffee more. And they trust James Bond, to your point. They're like, oh, yeah. if James Bond has it, <laughs> it's got to be great. He needs to be on time, right. Yeah. Uh, but, but okay, so we, the idea of having a campaign, I've never seen a coffee shop do that that has a physical location. And you tell me, but it feels like because why would we? Because we're here and we've already communicated to mm. people. You know? I, I think it is about trying to constantly stay on top of mind with your customer. So they see you when they're walking by the store, yeah. by your coffee shop, but what if they're not doing that? Like what if they are, when they're at home, they get an email or even on their phone. I mean, they have their phone all the time and they might be thinking about something else, like maybe a gift for their parents or, you know. And so I think it's about trying to, mm. it's, about const it's about trying to constantly, you know, have customers and consumers think about you. I used to, when I used to work in a marketing agency before, one of our clients was Coca-Cola. And I used to always be like, why does Coca-Cola need marketing? I mean, like, <laughs> everyone knows Coke, right? They, that's all they do. They are a marketing company. Yeah. And it's about constantly like having people think about it. Yeah. Well, why, why do they need marketing? Everyone knows Coca-Cola because of marketing, Yeah. right? Yeah. So in the idea that you're top of mind for a customer, Maybe it's that you need to think that the customer has lots of different minds. Like it's not just like the customer is always thinking the same way. Like you said, the gift, the the day that they're not really going to buy an extra thing, but yeah. today they're going to buy five extra things. So, but I struggle with the idea that I'm going to have a drip campaign hmm. of emails. Won't that just annoy them? Like what's the what's the right way to onboard a customer mm. and be in their business respectfully but effectively i think it is about giving value to the customer okay so um what do customers like can you help them make good coffee at home for instance so i think i'm pretty sure almost our first or second email is about brewing better coffee yeah um, for we actually for we also do personalized stuff. So once you buy the buy coffee, like on our checkout page, we ask what coffee maker you have, and then you get an email specifically with tips for making the best pour over or the best French press. So I think it's about like really going out and helping consumers. Okay, so that you put yourself in the consumer's place, and you think, okay, wh what could they possibly get from this? Mm -hmm. Is this just a hard sell or is this something that's going to benefit them? Yeah. And I suppose it's not just emails too. It's how you put yourself out there online as yep. well because your online presence on Instagram and on your website and all that is going to communicate a lot about how people will either want to engage further with you yep. or not. So how do you grab people's attention digitally to bring them into 
the your world and your culture to get them in you know, the door there? So one of the things that's worked really well for us has been press and affiliate. And we've done all of this in-house. So literally, my partner and I, we've sent cold emails to writers, journalists, who are writing about coffee subscription services, buying coffee online. We've actually pitched like, you know, this is what we do, this is why we're different, try it out. And then that's worked really well for people to even hear of our brand. So that's been like our number one channel for people hearing our brand and getting to our website. Right, and you're assuming that they want to hear from you. So what we've tried to do is reach out to writers who are writing similar articles. So for instance, um, someone writing best gifts for your dad, for instance, and coffee is a great plug right there. And we've tried to send emails to those specific writers, so not like just anybody as such, like not going into an editorial list and just planning it out. Okay. Um, and we've noticed that that if you send emails at the time when they're looking for products to review and it's in their right space, they, they're like, yes, I would like to try this out. I've not heard of you, but I get went to your website. This sounds interesting. I'll try it out. And then the next part is then on the website, how do you then keep telling your story? Mm -hmm. And so keep talking about like why we started this, uh, what's special about our coffee, what we're passionate about. Yeah. Um, and that's and doing that on Instagram. So if you go on Instagram for us, like we try to do that um, in many different ways. And I think constantly repeating it. Yeah. So you yourself have to go on the customer journey all the time to be able to finesse this and keep it fresh, right? Mm. We keep also um, doing new things. So for instance, uh, 2020, the pandemic, uh, we started virtual tastings and that got really popular. So what we do is the same five coffees, but we send like five glasses along with it and then like a modified version of a flavor wheel oh, yeah. and and you can join on zoom so we started as thinking you know people are not hanging out with their family anymore I mean at that point physically people are hanging out less so how do you virtually connect with with close people with friends relatives um, and people were tired of those boring zoom calls where you know yes. awkward conversation <laughs> so um, so yeah I think you do need to keep kind of finding new things to do and kind of go with the time and right. have so new things to talk about. It's not a set it and forget it kind of thing. No. You, you have to like, you have to use it as a constant conduit of communication yeah. uh, rather than just a, a, a widget that you keep in the closet until someone's like, hey, your website link is broken. And you're like, oh, I forgot I had a website, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, one last question here I have for you is, what, are, what would you recommend the first steps someone take to enhance their digital presence, to create more inroads for their customers, uh, to to buy, to engage, and to just benefit the business and, and their community? I think the number one, I feel like one of the first things is to really talk about why you're different. Because I think we talked about like, there are so many coffee shops, there's so many coffee roasters, there's so many brands. Yeah. Um, so how do you stand out? What's that one thing that's different about you? Why a customer should choose you versus others? Yep. Um, I do feel like press, reaching out to influencers, you can cold email. It doesn't, like you don't need a big agency. Um, <laughs> you do it respectfully, like don't send it to their personal email, send it to their work email. Um, don't harass them more than once or twice. But th I think that I think people underestimate um, how much you can just sort of just cold email and you can do it yourself and don't necessarily need a big you know, agency or an expensive thing. We can right. do a lot of it ourselves. You're giving yourself permission to do yeah, this stuff. Yeah, give yourself, yeah. Oh, good, yes. Well, I knew this was really fun. Um, and where can we learn more about Drift Away and what you offer? Um, our website is driftaway.coffee. So it's not .com, it's .coffee. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we're on Instagram. We do these tiny Thursdays that I that people seem to really love. And so again, do different things that make you stand out. Um, and yeah, that's where you can find me. Very fun. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chris. Well, what did you think? Uh, I hope that you enjoyed that. And ultimately, you know, conversations like this remind me that a lot of solutions can be discovered and implemented just by thinking about the customer and where they're coming from, 
how they're interacting with you in the moment, and then refining that and embracing it as a primary focus of energy and resource and your website, your social media, and all of these different areas where they uh, come in contact with you and your brand and your ethos, uh, and they make these purchases. These are just as important as when they come in for a latte, they buy a bag of coffee off the shelf. And uh, I'm glad for people like Anu who are here teaching us about these things. So a huge thank you to Anu. And if you are interested in any other information about Drift Away Coffee, all you need to do is go visit their website, which is driftaway.coffee and learn about how they approach sustainability and look at how they serve their uh, digital first customers there. So again, thank you very much, Anu. Now that would round it out for us, everyone, where this is the last conversation of our series of live interviews from the show floor coffee fest. And I, I always love doing these, bringing the value to you. If you didn't get an opportunity to go to coffee fest, you've got three more opportunities to do so this year. Go to coffeefest.com and get registered. There's a lot more content and more than I can fit on these shows. So this is just a sampling. A huge thank you to all of my guests on this series. Wonderful to sit down and chat face to face with you all. And thank you all for joining me on the show as usual. Thank you for your support of the show. Don't forget to subscribe to the show and also share it with uh, your friends and your community. Have an awesome day. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop.